Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 12 of Platform Enterprise, the show that platforms projects which empower. I'm your host, Rachel Donald, and I also write the Platform Enterprise newsletter, a weekly investigation into the policies and corruption which keep the world in crisis. Subscribe to get both the podcast and the newsletter delivered to your inbox every week at www.platformenterprise.com. All the newsletters and episodes are available on a free subscription, of course, but the best way to support Platform is to get a paid subscription of just $5 per month. And I would be extremely grateful if you did. Episode 12 means three months of the podcast, guys. Three months. Uh, Thank you so much for supporting us along the way and all of my amazing guests. And I can just say like I record a couple of weeks in advance and the guests just continue to be of the most incredible quality. Uh, I can't believe that I'm fortunate enough to interview all of these fantastic people. And I'm really grateful that you're here listening to them. So thank you. On the show this week is artist, activist, philosopher and all round total brainiac Blake Shaw. Blake gives a fascinating analysis of the left's failures over the past decades and how to organize radical politics in the remaining 10 years we have to fix the climate crisis. He also discusses why he's left the art world forever, his vision for liberating workers, and the incredible role free software could play in all of this. This is a hell of a conversation at the intersection of technology and philosophy. So, uh, buckle up everyone this conversation is not for the faint-hearted but i guarantee it will absolutely blow your mind so you were talking about the the vietnamese communist party's response to covid and the fact that you have had 30 deaths in the past year is that correct yeah it's been completely crazy watching the western world from over here I think it shows a lot of the contradictions and just kind of way repressed ideation plays out within Western society and this false notion of freedom as this kind of libertarian, liberty-based idea of just being able to, to do what you want, you know, to be able to go get, I don't know, McDonald's whenever you feel like, as if you can't do that in other countries. The the whole thing that's 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 really funny is that these countries, Vietnam and China, are portrayed in the West as irredeemably corrupt, irredeemably authoritarian, totalitarian, all of these kind of things. But throughout this crisis, like here in Vietnam, we have had the least amount of invasion of personal liberties of any country, pretty much. I was personally put under lockdown because my building had an outbreak and I got the flu and we were supposed to call the building and notify them if we had any symptoms. And this was right at the very beginning. So it was kind of like worrying and and the health department came and, you know, and they took my temperature and there, there weren't like very many tests at that time. So they didn't test me, but they put me under a 14 day personal quarantine in my building. Mm-hmm. And then eventually when that ended, our whole floor got quarantined. And then after that, our whole building got quarantined. And then after that, the whole city got quarantined. But because they followed rigorous standards of just, you know, just the recommended scientific idea of like how contact tracing should be carried out, just because they went by that with 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 a high amount of strictness, we have been able to really live our normal lives here, you know, mm-hmm. like there, there's been nothing like martial law. The things happening in the West are completely unthinkable here, right? Like the the invasiveness of the government, well, it's simultaneously doing nothing because, you know, what it seems like Western states have really chosen to respond how they do in every crisis, which is just through, you know, police state, state of emergency, with very little on the social alleviation side of things, doing very little to really care for public health in any kind of capacity. And because of that, you know, the West, there is this narrative like of, oh, well, China, Vietnam, or Asia in general, you know, 
it's this Confucianism that is very like authoritarian all the way down to the culture so they could handle that. And the actual reality is that we have had very little heavy duty regulations put in place. Right now, we don't even have to wear masks because we don't really have many cases at all in the country, if there's any right now. I'm not, I, I, I haven't even been keeping up, to be honest. So it's just totally black and white. And, it's, and, it, and it makes it quite clear watching this happen over there, you know, that Europe and North America, they have very much let this mass death happen because it has coincided with evictions and all of these things that are just completely canceled here. And it's been really this wholesale liquidation of the populations so that billionaires can quickly flip properties in order to make short gains on, especially in the United States, like mass murder is what I feel like it has to be considered as uh, at this point. I just want to pause you quickly there to get a little bit more into it. I think we also need to establish then what is different in the cultures in these countries rather than just the governments. Because ultimately what you were talking about, you know, the, the libertarian culture of Western states, I think is, in my opinion, more on the nose than talking about just the the government's fumbling attitude. And New Zealand is a very, very good example of that, where, I mean, they they have a Western culture. And yet the main difference was that everybody just followed what Jacinda said. (laughs) Everybody just listened to their prime minister and acted as a community. Like, this is what I need to have this very minor restriction on my personal liberty in order to ensure the well-being of my community and of the wider society around me. And that, to me, is an equal, if not actually more important requisite point of discussion, because if our culture was different and if our personal responsibilities were different and if our attitude to one another were different on the ground, then we probably wouldn't be voting in these fumbling governments anyway. I mean, I think that that's completely true as well. And the thing is, we have to look at the material economic conditions and where this whole major divide, ideological divide, has found its footing, especially in a place Mm -hmm. like Europe, where it's kind of rapidly made its way back since since the oxy vote in Greece, right? Okay. And then since 2008, this, this program of austerity has essentially led to two different gradations of proletarianization. You have on the one side, the kind of like elite labor aristocracy, if you will, of the intellectual workers, which includes everything from academics to programmers and designers and all of this kind of stuff that have also not seen their wages go up in the last decade. While rents have continued to hike, you know, I would be a part of this group, right? And then on the other side, you have the more traditional, classical working class that's getting paid about the same amount of money, but they aren't getting the same amount of recognition in society, right? Right. So there is this like prestige tied to the, you know, higher education workers. And then there is the more kind of classic chauvinist workerism uh, that has led to the rise of, you know, Nigel Farage and Brexit and all of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's rippling effects throughout Europe. And I think one thing about that, I mean, I don't know about New Zealand. I think that this is an interesting case to understand, but I, I, I really don't know much about New Zealand's government and all of this kind of stuff. I do know that here, so Vietnam is a country that for its whole independence, since its decolonization, has experienced the constant and persistent threat of information warfare from the NATO states, right? And and still today, like if you join any Facebook group in Vietnam, there are all of these Radio Free Asia people who, you know, are always posting anti-communist party like Western propaganda from Radio Free Asia, which is an organization that was started by the CIA that received billions of dollars from 
the U.S. government every year and and funds these anti-communist, it's, it's this anti-communist information warfare organization that is meant to try to build unrest in communist countries. So like because of that, they do have a, a tighter grip on the media. And I think that they're actually right too. I think in the West, we have this portrayal of these countries as not allowing freedom of speech, all of this kind of stuff. But when you actually live here, you see, okay, actually, you know, people are able to start their own magazines and their own stuff and everybody, and they have all their own local culture, but, you know, they do ban Western media organizations that are trying to delegitimize their government and start up trouble. And so when we see, you know, this whole QAnon effect happening in the U.S. that we know is connected to the highest levels of U.S. government, right? Like these senators, like speaking out in, on behalf of QAnon, like Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio and Pompeo and all these people that have like embraced QAnon, they would not be doing that if they thought that it was a party behind it that could undermine their interests in the long term, right? Okay. And it and it's kind of classic. It but it just shows you kind of everything that's wrong with this Facebook highly algorithmic capital based proliferation of media that we experience today and is, you know, directly amplifying these right wing conspiracy theories and movements that have played a direct role in in you know this whole anti mac anti masker anti vaxxer thing yeah, that's happening but, right now. But I think that I think again there needs to be a distinction between uh, media and press because we now live in an age of social media because we're now all content creators. When we talk about press and what concerns me uh, about authoritarian or totalitarian governments when we see that the press is being silenced, journalists should should play a vital role in challenging power and having the right to challenge power and to call out power. I, I want to ask you about, I mean, you've had success as an mm -hmm. artist, but you've also, you've had real impact on communities around the world doing, you know, work in, in Palestine, for example, which if I remember correctly, back in the day, it left you in quite some personal danger because the work that you were doing was having such a profound impact on, on the people there. Could you explain exactly what what you started doing and how you ended up in Vietnam? Yeah, I mean, I guess maybe I would like to start by prefacing that I think all of my work up till this point has been a tremendous failure. And I think anybody who has been active in leftist politics up until this point needs time for self-criticism and we all need to admit that our strategies have been tremendous failures and it needs right now the, the the reason why we need to face up to this reality is the simple reason that we are now on a timeline of this decade where drastic massive social, political, economic change must happen in a left-wing direction in order for this planet to even be remotely habitable in the coming decade. So it's it's time for all of us to to really get real. You know, and and so my my work over the last decade has been a mix of critical pedagogy and software and tactical media, really, working with different groups of activists, you know, usually already existing groups of activists, we come up with an idea and we develop some kind of technological means to do public space intervention. For instance, like the Bridge Project in Palestine, I developed the software or this software programming toolkit, this visual software programming toolkit for doing uh, live streaming, linked kind of like peer-to-peer -peer live streaming between Ramallah and Gaza 
in order to facilitate like video bombing sessions against Israel in support of the campaign to boycott Israel. So, you know, the idea is people in Gaza and in the West Bank, they cannot, for the most part, they cannot leave without going through huge bureaucratic loops. But for, for Gazans, they, for the most part, just cannot leave Gaza at all. And so I worked with Halash Gallery and the Katan Foundation and the Lata Refugee Camp in order to facilitate collaboration across the wall, these different activist groups culminating in these video bombing, video projection campaigns where we would do kind of like protest projections across the sides of buildings where live from Gaza and from Balata camp, artists and activists would write words on the sides of buildings like graffiti and messages in support of the BDS movement. And so most of my work has, in, in terms of like my tactical media activism stuff, has followed in that tra trajectory. Some kind of uh, series of workshops usually happening over the course of several months where we collectively build a piece of technology around an idea and then some kind of uh, uh, way to use that for interventionist politics. So for, for instance, I think really around the time that I decided to go and study philosophy, it was because I realized that I was lacking some kind of deeper ideological insight into the nature of revolutionary politics, right? And I, I, I was still really coming out of you know, this influence of Mario Tronti and Italian autonomia and this idea of there's some kind of production of subjectivity that we can est uh, estrange in order to develop new revolutionary consciousness, in order to take hold of the general intellect and blah, 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 blah. I was already starting to break up with that theory. And then I got to EGS and I started studying Badu. And then for the next uh, eight years, while doing all of, you know, my activism and living in activist collectives in Mexico and Denmark and all these places, while I was doing that, I got really interested in the foundations of mathematics and its relation to ontology. So that is the most impractical way, but it has come full circle since the since the pandemic started so i don't make much money at all on my artwork i make money doing commercial like photo booths for large events around the world i do installations for like hair messes fashion shows in tokyo and all of this wow. kind of stuff but it normally i'm on airplanes all the time because of this and so i've never really had the space there's never been really a kind of gap between my commercial work, my activist work, and my work in the textbooks. It's been like, okay, philosophy dissertation over here. You know, yeah. I'm I'm reading, you know, Cohen's proof of the independence of the continuum hypothesis and working through Badu and Hegel and Lacan and blah, 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 blah. At the same time, I am organizing this whole installation in Japan and then also preparing for some kind of thing that I was invited to related to the arts and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I think, you know, w w one major decision I have made since the pandemic started is just that I'm breaking off from the art world completely. I think, and it's just, it's just a matter of really being honest about what the art world is and could you yeah. could you define what the art like what the art world actually is not in terms of the its character but what you mean by art world first of all the art world is the system of galleries selling art commercially and then right. cultural institutions supporting artists independently but all of that is connected back to the money and interests of billionaires 
And right. in even in the the leftist anti art art space that I've existed in, you know, it's it's really just a different class of billionaires. And we always are kind of tiptoeing around the fact that, you know, that the people that are paying for our projects are our enemies in, you know, most senses of the word. If if we are true to any kind of uh, class struggle and communist politics. And, and the reason why our more radical projects never get supported are is because they actually have the potential to do something dangerous and the art world does not want this. I mean, I love so many artists and and I have so many friends in the art world, but the actual industry of the whole thing really taints the whole process, especially with, I think, activist projects. And it doesn't make sense for us to be doing these things in this space and looking for support in this space because Mm -hmm. I, because it's, really a matter of us undermining our own interest when we are doing that if we are honestly and seriously interested in revolutionary emancipatory politics right yeah yeah and yet i wonder as you're talking Mm -hmm. um because obviously we we all have to make a living so i imagine that you will have to continue your commercial work yeah yeah so I still just wonder if there is, despite whatever connections may need to exist or you may need to enable in order to be a part of an art world or in order to have a platform for your art, Mm -hmm. does it not still have value? Does it not still have value for the world? I mean, I guess it's also coming from a particular space of, you know, maybe it's even more specific to me because I'm really you know, a hacker, a programmer, and a philosopher who also makes video art. And, right. and, and, and I do these interesting projects, but all of my best projects had no connection to the art world whatsoever, right? They was completely just organized with activists. And really, from my experience, every time, you know, I've received some grant and had some curator involved, there is always a small but significant in terms of its impact on what is stated and what is shown and what is reproduced of the project. There's always been this need to just tweak things a little bit, tame the message just a little bit, but it's always enough. So it's also just a matter of seeing myself perpetually caught in, you know, under the interests of the curator and their reputation and what they have to be able to present at the end of it and what they have to cut out. I've come to terms with the fact that it's much more beneficial for me to try to organize in the software side of things Mm -hmm. Um, and specifically in the realm of free software. Right. And really taking right. up this idea of, well, actually tr- trying to unfree the free software, because I think, oh, you know, first of all, free software, it's not about, you know, the software not costing anything. You, you often have to pay for free software, but it's about the software being open for anybody to do anything that they would like with it. And that's actually stands in total contrast to what's called open source. How, how does that stand in, in contrast to open source? Because oh, I thought, because yeah. I'm not techie at all. And I thought open source meant that you can go into the back end and, and tweak whatever you need to. But you will not be able to republish it and you will not be able yeah. to resell it or use it in your software that you're creating. You don't have, you don't have freedom of oh. use value, right? Right. Okay. So um, it's not free. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. But but the thing is, you know, there is this fundamental, I think, ideological misrecognition at the heart of the free software movement that freedom can be reduced to aspects of liberty, right? 
that freedom can be reduced to aspects of liberty. Well, be, because essentially that is what the French. So, 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 you know, at the heart of the free software movement, which, which, which I would say I'm, you know, a part of, I'm, I'm a fellow traveler, right? I'm not here to, to dismiss the free software movement. I think that they've made some great accomplishments, but the idea that this this category this category of users right that mm. is at the core because you know free software activists typically describe themselves as activists for users rights right activists for users rights okay mm-hmm and generally, what they're talking about is the right for programmers, right, to mm-hmm. use any software they encounter in any way that they wish. But mm-hmm. they're talking about the source code. This category of the users, I mean, I think it's important to recognize that there's only two industries that call their customers users. It's drug dealers and software, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> And, yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and I think that this is quite something important because what we need to be talking about is workers' rights. And we need to be stressing free software as a, a labor movement to protect the producers of software because that's what programmers are. We are workers. And, and we need to protect our right, this, this kind of interesting uh, place where we have some control over our means of production, not full control. I think too many hackers are under the illusion that they somehow control the server stacks that they are dependent on. We're still in absolutely proletarianized relations of production. So the first step, I think, for free software is for us to say it's unfree software. And and things, because freedom is just as much about time as it is about, you know, usability or hack or like our ability to hack uh, a repository Mm. or whatever. And so once we get away from this thing of, you know, in the free software movement, they say, oh, it's, you know, free as in beer. And it's like, okay, well, already we're comparing freedom and beer. So, 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 I mean, there's already just like huge philosophical problems, but if we make it free as in time, you know, it, this starts to become a much more communist perspective with which we can approach things. But but at the same time, I have to say that once you start to get into free software activists' discourse on, on their reasoning for choosing these categories, they do have quite strong positions. So for instance, right now, I have gotten involved on the design side with this project called Geeks. And actually, this is something that's going to take, this is going to be one of the more interesting things we talk about. I don't know if I want to maybe give you a second to ask any questions about things in the past before I branch on to to the subject of Geeks, because it's quite some interesting, new, conceptually uh, deep subject matter that we can we can dive into here. Okay, well, I suppose, apart from the fact that, you know, this it's kind of it's kind of new terminology. I'm trying to find the exact space and definitions in my head as you speak. But my main question mm-hmm. right now, and maybe you can answer this with geeks, is how this free software movement and how appropriating that to time in order to adhere more to a communist way of thinking, mm-hmm. how does that relate to your average person who is not a programmer and yet who is kind of like the means of production for content creation that is generating so much data and therefore so much wealth for these for, for software companies around the world? That's my one question. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that if anything, you know, th- this points to the gains of the free software movement, which I think too many leftists are spontaneously antagonistic towards in some sense, because they see things like GitHub, which is just pure neoliberalism. And a a lot of them are also programmers, myself included. You know, I I can say a lot of the software I have written over the past 15 years 
has not been free. In fact, I've kept it completely private because if I had it on GitHub, I'm somebody that gets uh, a couple emails every month asking where they can download the thing from some advertising agency that wants to, you know, put my installation in front of their product. And if I made it free, it would have been like, I wouldn't have had a job or I I would have had a much worse job. It's actually been quite the the way that I have uh, distributed, you know, only what's necessary to make any uh, of the work that I make, but never the, the whole of any one installation has also been quite smart. And I think that there is the idea that the free software movement is against not giving away all of your code all of the time, which is just not the case. Mm. But I think that the ability for the the activism of free software activists to maintain this freedom through licensing and through license that must be carried over into in, in perpetuity of use has allowed programmers to maintain in, in some areas, you know, but really just in the free software area, those that participate in it, people have been able to maintain more power and control over their code and their means of producing it. Whereas with open source, it's the total opposite. Open source encourages everybody to just give away all of their software you know, under a quasi free license. And it really becomes about building a resume. And within the open source world, it's been more of the Spotifyification of software. So people that have kind of stuck with the open source model and are like programming and Electron and React and all of this really corporate stuff made by Facebook and Google. That they like now are existing in a kind of realm where it's all like, yeah, maybe I'll get to go from my hobby as a programmer to like doing it, you know, at a really shitty job one day. And so this kind of model that a lot of musicians suffer from today affects a lot of the people that went open source without going all the way into the free territory, which is a different set of licenses. But there are groups like uh, Telecommunistan in in Berlin who have copy far left licenses that are meant to only make any commercial gain off any code profitable for workers. And I and and I really think that this is the direction that we need to take things. I, I think that because even most people, I think, in the free software space there has been a lot of discussion about like whether the free software movement is dead but then i think when you see a project and when you start to understand a project like geeks and what that is you start to see that no it's actually going very strong and it, they have they've built a platform for advancing their cause that is you know just as strong and durable as Emacs that had been kind of the heart and hub of free software and still remains the heart and hub of free software today. And it's really, I think, the next kind of generation of that Emacs thinking. And the people involved in Geeks are, you know, a lot of the main people, there's been a lot of controversy where a lot of the older free software activists you know, were involved or defended people that were involved in Epstein and stuff like this. You know, it's all these people from MIT. Really? Well, I don't want to get into, well, you know, it's, it's Richard Stallman, who I think is a quite uh, complex character. Who is he? I mean, I'm very, very far away from the software world. Yeah, he he, uh, he is the founder of the free software movement. And he is, oh, the, shit. Okay. Uh, and he is the creator of Emacs which is the greatest piece of software ever written by far. It's a text editor that was written in 1975 in Lisp. And it is still the most amazing software you can possibly use. And it's completely free. So I would say anybody listening, if you're, if you're a writer, if you use text a lot, go, Mm. go get into Emacs. And if you spend some time with it, you'll be very happy. But you know, the non-software left they, you know, he, he has made just some bullshit statements 
light misogynistic statements, kind of like things that are kind of controversial, like Zizek said, you know, it's kind of stuff like this. It's And it's the same kind of leftists trying to cancel Stallman as the people that are trying to cancel Zizek. And, and, and in both cases, I think like when like certain things Zizek said about refugees, I think like we should absolutely disagree with Zizek, but we don't need to like demand that his publishers quit publishing him and, you know, this whole massive anti Zizek campaign that emerged that is just totally like a self suffocating distraction. Now there's plenty of people that get canceled for all the right reasons and absolutely they should be canceled, but nobody on the right wing has ever been canceled, right? They are uncancelable. And so instead we have ended up, you know, just Er- eradicating the left of so many leftists, you know, oftentimes by, I think, very young leftists who are, you know, very young activists who sometimes don't even remain activists for very long. Yeah. It's, it's extremely infantilizing. If you were to lay a binary of oppression on one end, cancel culture seems to be sort of the exact opposite of that, that there there's an, an extreme emotional uh, reaction about, as you say, perceived sort of like su- subjective moral lines mm-hmm. that everybody has to fall in line to. Total. I, I mean, we have to look at things more s- simply than that. Even it's it mm. for me, it's simply a matter of the left needs to focus its energy on on our goals. Right? What do we want to achieve, and how are we going to achieve it? But maybe we should go a, a little bit into my current work. So what is Geeks? I, I want to say to any left-wing organizer <clears throat> who has a little bit of computer skills, uh, I think that the best thing you could do during your lockdown is switching your operating system to Geeks. Let me let me explain what it is. Okay. Yeah, please. And in a, maybe in a... <laughs> less techie literate manner because I mean I know what an operating system is but that's well, about let, it let, let, let me try to uh, I, I would like to try to explain it in a way that's clear but but I don't want to sacrifice the some of the technical discussion because I think that this is where it really becomes interesting but so Geeks is a what we call a source-based operating system from GNU, from, from the organization that promotes free software that was founded by Richard Stallman. And, and so Geeks, it is an operating system, but it's really more of a platform for designing operating systems. Now, what does that mean? So Geeks is a operating system built on a purely functional package manager. So I, so I said that it is a source-based distribution. Mm. This means that all of the software that you bring into your computer will be built from source by a package manager. Okay. All the software that you bring into your computer will be built from source by a package manager. Okay. So okay. so normally with with an operating system, you will download some software, I don't know, from like the let's just say you go to a website, you click download, you yeah. get the disk mounted image, you unpack it, you run the installer, right? Yeah. Instead with a source-based distribution, all of the software you get it is the pure source code and the package manager builds the source code into the application that you that you will run and this is where it bo- it's both going to get confusing but if you stick with me i'm going to try to make it clear so that it mm-hmm. uh, so, so 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 that you might be able to get to the aha moment about what okay. why this is so important and why this is okay something kind of perhaps liberating in technology. So as the the packages come across the the wire to your computer, 
each part of the build that happens in increments generates a hash. And, and actually, because it is purely functional, which means that everything in the chain of packaging is defined as a pure function, because of that, each step of the build, it can prove the correctness of the build the same way you would do a mathematical proof and prove that proof. It's the same kind of technology that goes into or that comes out of automatic theorem provers in mathematics. So for each part of the build, it will prove the correctness of, of the build and print a hash, a 32 character hexadecimal string, right? And as it's doing that, it is under it is creating a position in a chain of composition of every single piece of software that is on your computer. So it has mm -hmm. an address and and uh, a compositional notation for defining all relations of every piece of software on your computer. Now, okay. So okay. that like essentially showing how everything is interconnected, showing showing the how your whole computer how it's all linked, how it's all one. How it, A absolutely. Right? And and so like with geeks for instance, at any second I can pull up a graph and suddenly see a, a diagram of all of the interconnected software processes happening on my computer at any time, right? Uh, so you could see where like data is going or what something is taking and, a you know, these. Absolutely. Yeah, right. Now, so it's like the DNA, shows you the DNA. Well, well, so, so that, that is, I mean, I think that this is quite an interesting aspect of it. But, yeah. but 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 it gets more interesting. So considering all of your software is built and defined in formally compositional terms, you can record the state of your operating system at any moment, and you can return to your exact place and time at any moment. Like if I had my desktop. Uh, assemble like I can go and visit my computer from one month ago. Now this is you know this is quite interesting for programmers, obviously, because it means you have an unbreakable system. You can always return to a place where where it was working. It's kind of like uh, God mode and time travel or something. Yeah, yeah, no, it it, it totally is. But yeah. to help illustrate why this is so interesting, I'll use a example for artists. So let's say you are making music on your computer, right? Now, mm -hmm. even though people can, you know, save their files at a certain place and come back to that, it's going to be really hard for musicians to get, like, if they're in some kind of jam session where they're, they've really hit a sweet spot, they might still choose not to experiment even further because, because it will be hard to get their system back to that exact same sweet spot, even with the saving capacities of whatever DAW they're using. Sorry, I don't understand. Why, why would it be difficult for... Why can't they just save it? Well, because when we think about how like audio signal processing works... Like most digital instruments involve what are called infinite impulse response filters, which are filters that exhibit complex behavior due to the fact that they're based on feedback. So actually filters themselves, audio filters are based on principles of feedback and that amount of feedback can lead to levels of complexity that cannot merely be captured uh, in a snapshot that gets stored in a file on your computer. Mm. But if you're running your computer completely on free software, 
through the source-based distribution model where every part of every piece of software is known, you're able to capture that exact moment and return to it. So for visual artists, right? The, the, the problem of archiving code-based artworks is a huge problem. For instance, most of my artworks from 10 years ago I will have to go and find an operating system. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And with this, at any moment, you can revert back yeah. to that. You, you could go to 10 years ago without having to change things. But even on the deeper, like if we get really deep into the theory of computer science and because of the way what are called side effects in programming happen, it's actually incredibly difficult to faithfully reproduce any computation, right? You might be able to go and do Hello World and C++ and I'll go and do Hello World and we'll both get Hello World printed to the screen. What is actually happening in that computation is non-reproducible. If we actually got down and we actually examined what is happening in all of the threads, it is affected by the state uh, of your computer and the different processes that are running on it. Now, mm -hmm. Geeks is a stateless declarative programming operating system that's entirely built in Scheme, in the Scheme programming language, which okay. is one of the most powerful and theoretically deep and interesting programming languages you can use. And so with Geeks, when we say that it's stateless, this means that every time you power down, or at the simplest kind of illustration of it I think I could give, is that every time you power down your operating system, your, your computer, it will flush everything out of its uh, RAM, out of the memory entirely. Wow. So, so I can actually change the kernel on my operating system the heart the, the heart of that organizes all of the computations i can actually power down my computer and then restart it with a different kernel and have all of my files in the same place and and everything i can change any aspect of my computer and merely reboot it and have a completely different operating system bent to my needs. And, and I can reproduce that. I can take that operating system uh, and put it on a hard drive and load it up on your computer. I can put it on a server stack. And, and, and so the really clever people behind the project, Ludovic Cortez being the main uh, person leading the project, I think they had a really kind of interesting recognition that this absolute reproducibility will necessarily change the nature of software itself. For instance, even just with making applications, you're able to put your things in a small self-contained geeks container, and then that can be run on any computer, right? And produce the same results as long as you're not going beyond what the second computer is capable of. Um, is it, listen, for, you know, for people like me, Mm -hmm. It sounds like the kind of same principles of Dropbox, but much more complicated and an operating system. And, you know, just this ability to kind of like access what you need wherever and change things. And you know what I mean? It's more following in uh, and, and directly coming out of the idea of version control and software, but then taking that and making good on its promise because... Anyone who versions their their software or their design, anybody that's using Git, uh, for example, not GitHub. Like I don't use GitHub, but I'm a Git user. The GitHub is just a website for hosting your Git repositories. So Git is the software that does the version control, right? The thing is, I'm I'm just at the beginning of working on uh, a kind of Marxist case for a left that embraces Git and we start, not GitHub, right? Because uh, like when you bring up these kind of conversations with leftists, they're just like, oh, GitHub, 
that's the most neoliberal thing ever. And, you know, they tweeted it back to you on Twitter as if that's, you know, something that is less neoliberal in some sense. But, but, but <laughs> so, okay, what is version control? So <laughs> yeah. one thing that happens in software development is breaking changes, right? Like changes in your operating system, updates, things like that, that then cause your code to stop working. Now, if you record every step of the software, you should be able to roll back to a version that does work. Or, or let's say you're working with a team. I think this is a better example. If you're working with a team and somebody adds an object or adds a, a script to the repository of an application, that could cause the whole thing to stop working. Yes. So they can roll back and then submit an earlier commit to the project. So this was happening and, you know, all the way back from the 80s, you know, I mean, they were even doing stuff like this in the Soviet Union. But it was all based around this idea of centralized version control. You would have one server stack that a whole company is working off of. It, all, all the repositories are, are stored on a single server stack. But then if uh, a virus hit that, that server, you know, it could compromise the entire project. So Git comes around as a solution to do distributed version control where people are able to have their repositories both on their computers and on a server, and then across many other people's computers, all serving the different code. So, so when I'm using Git, I can instantly, like from my text editor, from Emacs, you know, pull up uh, somebody's code and start reviewing it. And I can start comparing the difference through all kinds of different algorithms between my code and their code. And what's interesting here, I think, is what I think, if we stop looking at software through the free software lens of software being about users and their freedom to use and modify and redistribute code, and we start looking at software as labor, right? What we start to see is that software is the is the concentration of abstract general generalized labor time that has taken on the social character of the relations of production in a qualitative dimension as a form of space right nope <laughs> <laughs> nope don't you go running off <laughs> um okay so are we talking about the kind of software that people are programming in their quote unquote free time we're, we're talking about all software all right, right all software okay mm -hmm. and software as labor so the coding that's going into it as as labor yes and people <laughs> qualitative relation of production as uh, yeah what do you mean oh well, i mean you know first of all just you know like any marxist would hear what i said and they would say okay all you just said is that software is a commodity right <laughs> um uh, you would have just said in a in a in a marxist way according to a marxist analysis that software mm -hmm. is is a commodity it is it is a object endowed with the social quality the, the the social character of the relations of production manifest it, as time manifests in space right as an object of exchange that is subordinated to exchange value throughout most of my 20s i was still really uh fixated on the idea that any communist revolution has to emerge from fundamentally spontaneous conditions in which workers become emancipated and, and, and from there, through their ability to own and control the means that they produce society with, 
will produce a form of social relations that we could never imagine from our current epistem or, you know, our, our present paradigm. But now I am convinced that what we need now more than any boots on the ground activism is we need to simply think about what comes next. We, the, uh, and it's important that I called this a fixation of mine from the twenties, mm -hmm. because I think that it fills within the space of activism, the, 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 this kind of thinking, it, it, it allows us to forego making any concrete organizational plans. And because we have no ideas and no practical ways of achieving them, we are not able to get the average worker on our side. And we remain, you know, Marxist PhD students that are, you know, perpetually relegated to the space of proletarianized, precarious worker, while at the same time representing an elite bourgeois class that the working class despises, right? The whole academy, you could argue, especially the Academy of Arts, is kind of decaying at its very core because of that exact contradiction, I think you could argue right now. Totally. Absolutely. The thing that I want to try to kind of think through and get, but, but I think get doesn't go far enough, right? Get starts with a promise, but it fails on the promise that your software will not be broken by external means because of the way you stage and manage the production of it. Because anybody that's used Git and has had to do considerable plumbing knows that at times it can also become your worst enemy. Okay, so from a Marxist point of view, you know, the, the classic question of Marxism, you know, of Marxist debates is, will there be money in communism? Marx's capital is in many ways a critique of money itself and its connection to the wage and the way that is bound up with the privation of and separation of workers from their means of production. So like a, a classic Soviet joke tells us that at a meeting of the common turn, Luna Charsky says to Stalin, says, Comrade Stalin, yeah, please tell us, in communism, will there be money or will there not be money? And Stalin, you know, thinks for a moment and then he says, well, you know, there will be money and there will not be money in communism. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and then so Luna Charsky says, oh, Comrade Stalin, please enlighten us with this brilliant dialectical synthesis, money and not money. And Stalin says, it's simple. Some people will have money and some will not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but, 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 you know, this, this does point to an impasse, right, in Marxist leftist debates in general about how do we overcome capitalism. Yeah. And I think with what we're seeing within a lot of the free and open source software community happening and it, it's in its own libertarian kind of way in this potlatch kind of space what we're seeing is the reemergence of symbolic exchange in a way that that involves the direct and transparent comparison of workers' means of production, because we are actually comparing our code visually against the code of others and opting in what we will bring into our code and, and what we will leave out. And so, so, so here is my controversial proposal that is quasi dystopian, but you know, I think if anything, we lost our chance for any utopian vision to be to be in any way practical. We have 10 years now. The, the planet is falling apart. In, in no matter what your standpoint is, the coming decade will and, and coming decades will 
a priori be in some sense dystopian. It is not our task to imagine the best of the worst possible worlds, but but the best possible worlds are already out of the uh, realm of possibilities. And so my like kind of speculative proposal that's just barely in the works right now is if we want to move from, you know, chauvinist nationalism to communist internationalism, there needs to be sort of defining changes to the social makeup of uh, existing communities. And, you know, with the birth of the nation state, one of the defining characteristics is the mass literacy, right? The adoption and the creation of a national language, you know, that homogenizes disparate ethnic groups into a singular national body, right? That has a form of representation that is bound up to the state apparatus, et cetera, et cetera. But what would be a palpable proposal for working class people to get them onto the page of expropriating the wealth of billionaires entirely? And I think in some sense, it has to be a matter of promising a mass technological literacy drive to get everybody and, 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 and the promise of technological education available for everyone because we need to start thinking in terms of communities that have their own servers that they are able to develop their own community infrastructure for carrying out their forms of self-governance. And I think that there is something to be said about making the case for ending the use of money in exchange for some kind of some kind of immutable database that records the amount of work both manual labors and intellectual labors have put in that buys them certain frames of ability to work with to 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 govern over technological stacks okay essentially deconstructing the status of certain jobs and professions equalizing work so that it it's a, becomes a question of the time spent producing as opposed to what you are producing and the time that you spend building your community essentially would result in the time that you have or or your position in in governance in governing that community yes so my motto here is another technocracy is possible and it's a proposal for and, and i haven't even worked it out yet but it is a proposal you know so if technocracy is the rule by those that carry some kind of expertise as opposed to meritocracy, which is the rule by those that have been deemed the best workers by those that already carry capital and power. We see yeah. that like today's present Silicon Valley technocracy is actually just a uh, rule by, you know, some of the most ruthless, vengeful techno capitalist that aren't good programmers they aren't interesting thinkers they are just you know capitalist managers that have adopted their own techno philosophical positions on how the world should work and are doing everything that they can to to control the production of knowledge and how it gets redistributed in order to gain power and capital for themselves and to and to maintain and expand their reign over the production of surplus value. Also, like some people 
I hear them say things that they still have some kind of weird identification with meritocracy. And they're like, oh, but you know, like I worked, you know, so long on my dissertation on Benjamin, you know, I, I could still hardly pay my rent. Yeah, because the people in power that award merit are they are not interested in awarding you merit. Merit is not duly earned. Uh, it, it's only duly earned insofar as it benefits the interest of the meritocrats. Very, very teeny tiny win-win uh, situations for a very small percentage of the population. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, 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 and the thing is, when we talk about communism um, or, or socialism, you know, we are talking about the liberation of workers' time. Workers should be able to spend their time how they want, right? And yes, yeah. but in the vision that you gave of technocracy, mm -hmm. it does not seem like that because, I mean, if you... <sighs> If we don't address whatever socio-psychological issues in our culture that we have around, you know, identity that enables and encourages, you know, your average person, myself included, to kind of latch on to these exploitative systems such as capitalism in order to save oneself. Mm -hmm. you know, if we don't address that culture, that very individualistic culture as well such vision you know like the technocratic vision that you gave you know my first my thought went well somebody's going to work a lot somebody's going to work really 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 a lot so that they can have governance or somebody's going to hack absolutely absolutely you know and so you you you're you're definitely hearing a decent programmer say i deserve power no i'm just kidding but the thing is what 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 i think there needs to be is the creation of a dual power system of governance Traditionally, dual power has been about united system of workers' councils that is able to use strikes and to leverage their ability to, to not work or to disrupt work in order to build power against the ruling politicians. So my idea would be essentially, you know, it would be in a way to sublate the current dichotomy between the city and the countryside that is so central to the very mechanisms of capital and to sublate that into a dual power antagonism between manual laborers and intellectual laborers doing technical work. And the idea is that at any moment, the machines that the technocrats require to, to develop their technology and to produce certain things that end up producing the social conditions of society are controlled and maintained by the manual laborers at the bottom that, that build those that do the mining for the minerals that are needed to make computers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The whole thing is I'm trying to promote a somewhat unsavory vision of the future that is still uh, utopian from the sad state of humanity that we're currently experiencing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, and I understand that, and I think it's important. Many people, God, do have, you know, we need as many visions as possible and as many ideas as possible, and we certainly need to feel a sense of possibility in creation that having some impact or change or difference, you know, is, is within our power. I'm just, I'm mistrustful whenever a vision of uh, a future is still centered around power. Now, it's not to say that it's not to have the ridiculous utopian ideal that, that, that power will suddenly dissolve one day, but rather to, to instead change the language around it, perhaps to something like governance where there is a weight of responsibility, where there is, like, even community is present in that word, governance. 
management, where the, the idea of ensuring that the, that the whole, you know, machine, uh, community, whatever it is, runs smoothly, as opposed to power, mm -hmm. uh, having power, being in power, and using power, because what, what was it I read recently? It was funny, about that power is always a force. Uh, and it's always quite a violent force. And it's often in a binary of, you know, to take taking power, you know, somebody else has to lose it. Whereas governance, I think, is a very, has the linguistic capability to free ourselves from that understanding of power that has kind of led to, you know, an exploitative um, system of capitalism. You, you, yeah, go for it. You want to hear <laughs> my quasi solution? to yes. this predicament yeah okay it's so nerdy okay <laughs> but, 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 but it's, it's it's something that i think also i i think if you're a philosophy student yeah. out there listening to this <laughs> your dreams have been crushed <laughs> <laughs> your your phd is going nowhere, and that's precisely why you aren't finishing it. No, I'm kidding. Sorry, but um, <laughs> uh, that, that, this is coming as a, a, from a, another philosophy student. But, but 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 get on geeks, because this this all becomes quite interesting. So my solution to this question of power, right? And also, I think if anything, I'll, I'll preface things by saying I think any leftist politics that is anti-power, uh, we should immediately ignore these people because. All politics is about gaining power, and what we need now is politics geared towards taking power and taking hold of the means, to taking back, expropriating the means of production from these psychophant billionaires who are hellbent on burning the planet to the ground and hiding out in their billionaire abode bunkers across the world. So it is imperative that we do this, I think, for the sake of humanity itself, it doesn't matter if you think power is morally bad, if you end up doing something ethically correct with it. Um, but in what instance of history have we shown that people who gain power tend to do ethically good things with it? I understand that what, what you're correctly saying is like we're running out of time. Yeah. We don't really have the time to sit down and solve, you know, the, the cultural issue. And yet it has to be part of the, the discussion, because otherwise, what's to say that, you know, another system of corruption doesn't simply take its place. I mean, look at what happens gen generally when there's a revolution, yeah. what happens? It's like the shadow emerges. So, you know, in French, they were off with their heads and, you know, socialism and abolish the monarchy. And now you still have a ruling bourgeoisie class mm -hmm. just embedded in that fabric of socialism. And you know what? It's harder to get rid of now. So I'll just briefly say, before I get back to my quasi nerd solution to the problem, uh -huh. first of all, Anybody who considers themselves to be somebody that's interested in revolutionary politics needs to a priori accept that revolution is always a terrible thing. And I mean that yeah. in the sense of terror, right? The French uh, terror and revolution go hand in hand with one another. With the French Revolution, you know, we had the, the French terror. With the Russian Revolution, there was the first, the white terror. The Western states, you know, invaded Russia and were raping and killing, hanging people, burning entire villages alive. And, and, and then, you know, Trotsky responded with the Red Terror. And, and, and anytime significant power land, property, all of this stuff uh, that makes up power sorry, is, is at stake, there will be terrible things that happen. So I think it comes along with any emancipatory politics, to be honest. And I don't, I don't want to say that that becomes like a excuse for the horrible atrocities of Stalinism and all of this kind of stuff. No, absolutely not. We need to deeply think through how to prevent an outcome like Stalinism uh, in every sense of the word. But we, we should not let that prevent us from actually engaging in what we say we're interested in, which is revolution. Okay, but my solution to the power problem within my purely fantastic dystopian technocracy is the right to bootstrap and the right to learn how to bootstrap. Can you define bootstrap for me? 
Yes. This gets down to the most fundamental ontological questions that you could possibly deal with when it comes to computation. In fact, it's the site of the ontolo- like what we call in philosophy, the ontological problem, the question of reality in itself, ultimate reality in computation itself. What do you need to make a uh, compiler for the C language, which is the most kind of low level, closest to the machine, fundamental language for computers. What do you need? Well, you need a C compiler that can compile the compiler, right? Mm -hmm. So where does the, where does the, where does it end? How do we get back to what was the original first compiler to get that C compiler, right? Now, it's like uh, the Big Bang, right? Uh, absolutely. Well, like what was before the Big Bang, yeah. Now, mm-hmm. now, why is this interesting when it comes to power? Well, because it comes down to the very question of the possibility of privacy within a technologically mediated economy. So let's say you are some person that wants, you know, that wants to experience privacy in your digital life, right? Yeah. You would probably go and Google, like, what is the most secure operating system I can use? But the whole thing is you don't know what is going on with that source code. So you'll prob- So if you're really serious about it, you will build that operating system from source to ensure that nothing's been modified and that there's no bugs in it. But then in that process, you're going to be relying on a C compiler. And the whole thing, uh, so, so people in the bootstrapping community have demonstrated that it is possible to put like anonymous, nearly impossible to track down compiler bugs into a C compiler that embeds certain bugs into the binary code that are untraceable that will be transmitted to all software that is built with that compiler. And bugs are bad, right? Well, it's a backdoor we're talking about. For instance, you know, Apple has like committed itself to security. You're completely insecure on an Apple computer. Don't even pretend like you are, but you're 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 more secure, but you're giving your data just specifically to one corporation. But the whole thing is, if the compiler that Apple is using, if at some point in its creation, because all of this stuff is created in a distributed collaborative way now, if somebody from the NSA or CIA made a plot to just embed a small backdoor, they can not only compromise your operating system, but all the software that everybody will download. It doesn't matter if you're using Signal. It doesn't matter if you're doing this or that. They're able to exploit these backdoors and get anything and and survey you in any way that they want, right? Through a compiler. Uh, Through through embedded compiler bugs that then spread the, the backdoor into all software that was ma- that that was produced with that compiler. Now, like the bootstrappable community has identified something like 3000 uh, of these within existing commonly used C++ compilers. They have demonstrated that they are able to actively produce these and and yeah. and and all software that gets produced with the compiler because all of your software is at some stage compiled. So their simple point, which I think you have to take to heart, is that considering this is possible, you have to imagine that every nation state that is engaged in perverse abuse of their citizens' privacy and is spying on them, which is the vast majority of major nation states in the world, uh, they are all doing these things. So most of our software is compromised. So now 
The solution is you can get a seed uh, compiler, right? And if you build a C compiler from the seed compiler and you bootstrap each part, so it's called bootstrapping because you're doing the impossible job of picking itself up or, or building itself up by its bootstraps. That is the only way you can be assured that your software is not compromised. Now, right. with Geeks, beyond all of this stuff, multi-dimensional transaction, I, uh, transactions, I didn't even get into the bulk of what Geeks makes possible. It's really something quite extraordinary. Just the way that it turns your computer into this modular system that is keeps a record of itself, and those records can be merged at different points so you can combine different units of time across different periods of space yada 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 but but beyond that you can bootstrap the entire operating system so nobody would ever be able to hack into you well it's the only way you can be sure that there are no back doors in your in your software it is the only it is the only possible way so like the like idea of this like mass technological literacy drive is to make sure that everyone has the right to bootstrap their stack. And okay, so this doesn't solve bigger problems of power dynamics and stuff, but I, I'm going to leave that for the revolutionaries to think about. And I'm going to just focus on the day after, but mm -hmm. it does allow a certain degree of autonomy and independence for communities that are organized according to technological stacks that they have produced or that they are the producers of. You know, I think it's very interesting. Even though I, I'm completely technologically illiterate, mm -hmm. I'm actually thinking of a sentence I read last night in Viktor Frankl's uh, Man's Search for Meaning, in which he talks about the provisional existence and a man in a provisional existence, which is an unknowable state that will go on for an unknowable uh, amount of time, cannot act, essentially. Mm -hmm. And it is those men that lost any kind of morality that let the concentration camps affect, that degenerate them, essentially. And who is who decayed? His word, his word was, was decayed. They they just lost, you know, lost themselves, lost their humanity. Mm -hmm. And listening to you there, it made me think of that because I was thinking about, you know, God, well, you know, I I, I grew up in a working class area in Scotland, and I'm like, I can't imagine many people actually there, you know, wanting to become that technologically literate or or wanting to quote unquote achieve that or do that and then I wondered if it's not because the provisional existence that we have now the life in which we all seem to have to succumb to there's no end in sight there's no end of of change perhaps for many people there seems no possibility of making things better and so I wonder if, as you say, you had this mass technological literacy drive mm -hmm. and you made something so fundamental to one's selfhood, mm -hmm. privacy, mm -hmm. if you made that sovereign right. Mm -hmm. and, and yet even better, something that you had to build yourself, exactly. like it's there, you just have to go and do it. I actually can imagine that that possibility, that annex to reality... <laughs> would actually encourage a lot of people to to learn the skills and achieve it because something can be done for themselves. A absolutely. I think that there should be other stipulations like we should have, we, we should hope and we should want and promote the idea of universal free education internationally. At any, any age, you know, you can go and you can keep studying. And if you study, that's fine. I, I mean, I think... Part of the, one of the biggest messages that the left needs to be honing down right now is that climate catastrophe is simply, or maybe not simply, but 
has everything to do with the fact that we have to spend our time doing banal, pointless tasks that destroy the planet. And But if people were given the time to do nothing if they wanted to and could also work on the things that they do want to and everybody was guaranteed a good quality of life, you know, for, for, for doing such things, you know, I think that the solutions to climate change would come about simply from the eradication of this dimension of uh, commodity fetishism where the relations between us people have become relations between machines, you know? And it's about turning around that relation where the relations between machines have become relations between people in a kind of sense, people working on machines. We're actually all engaged in what the machines are doing. Maybe our news actually talks about this. There's a sense of how can you expect a population that has no clear role, purpose, or meaning to A, take care of themselves, and B, take care of you know the world around them, of their greater environment. Again, it goes back to that provisional existence. And funnily enough, I'm thinking of Jordan Peterson now as well. And why the, his message has, has spread virulently through the young male community. Yeah. Yeah, well, he's yeah. talking about this thing about purpose and you know what damn it he's right he wants to sell them the just going back to doing meaningless tasks of commercial capitalism and cleaning up your room at the beginning of the day as the way of like having purpose in the world no the, the way of having purpose in the world is to see your subjectivity produce effects in the world. So what I'm working on right now inside Geeks and as a as, as a platform within Geeks is this project called Cybersyn, or it's, it's, it's a piece of software called Cybersyn that it is a diagrammatic program, metaprogramming language based on Scheme that includes aspects of program synthesis using SMT solvers. So what's an SMT solver? It's a spatial modulo theory. Think of it this way. It is a, a program that solves really hard, complex problems. And so program synthesis is based on instead of coding and writing instructions you know, say, computer, take this file and put it in this folder when this happens, right? Instead of doing that, you create a, a specification, which is kind of like a speculation, where you define some general parameters that must always hold true, and you ask the computer to create the in-between difficult-to-solve aspect and it spits out a program that does what you wanted it to do that's insane it's, it's pretty cool stuff so there's this programming language that makes this quite easy that's based on scheme and it's based on bracket specifically because scheme and lisp it's a whole kind of family of languages and it's, it's called rosette and you know i come from a community of people working on badu's work and specifically, uh, a lot of people working on mathematical formal methods in ontology and ontology and politics. And also, I think like within the last 10 years, we've had a lot of a, a lot of good demands or, or demands that are on the right kind of path, but they've never materialized. Stuff like Cernusek and Williams, you know, with the Accelerationist Manifesto, you know, they're talking about computational modeling, all of this kind of stuff. But then nobody really got to it. Like PhD, philosophy PhDs, who knows how many have been written about computational modeling in the last decade of like communism and all of this stuff, but nobody actually ever went and did the computational modeling. Why do you think that is? Well, th this is the thing. I'm thinking that it is because they lacked programming language and a programming environment specifically for doing this kind of stuff. And that is what Cybersyn seeks 
to right. to to handle in some certain kind of sense. Because one thing is, I've been a user of a programming environment called Maxim SP, which is for really any kind of multimedia, but it's a visual programming language where you type code into boxes that you then link together through patch cords. So you're kind of like creating diagrams. Think about about it like this, where you'll say, okay, I have this algorithm here, and I want this algorithm to do to, to act on on this one, right? And so you you drag a cord from one box to the other box and you plug them together. Ah, yes, like those things in primary school where you had to draw a line between two things to say, you know, this is equal to that or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like a, like, <laughs> like, a, like a diagram, like a function. Yeah, yeah like functions, yeah. exactly. So my idea, uh, what one of the great things about Max is, is that you can, as you're coding, you're also building the user interface and it all works in real time, right? Okay. And so I want to bring this uh, kind of practice to the realm of, of, of metaprogramming, of scheme. Because metaprogramming is all about you program your programming language into another programming language specifically for dealing with whatever problem you need to solve. And so one thing since the pandemic started that I've been doing for money is I've started taking up gigs in UX design. And I, n- I never even knew what that was. It's like a fancy website, a graphic designer in some kind of sense. But th- through that, I've been exposed to this whole field of design systems where you create uh, small components of designs systematically that can be grouped together by a team to build more complex designs. And from using the software and and seeing this kind of like mass, because like when you're working uh, on a UX team, it's all remote work today. I'm on, I'm on Figma in front of my computer working with somebody and we're, doing like multiplayer real-time design together, right? Mm -hmm. And we're all building off this design system that has certain constraints at the bottom. And so the goal of Cybersyn is to create, to to add this kind of component-based vector graphics drawing to visual programming so that programmers, but also philosophers, and anybody who's willing to learn a little bit of programming, because it's really not that hard, will be able to create their own visual, interactive visual notation systems for designing and synthesizing programs that can also be rapidly deployed. It's completely free. You can put it on a server and it's all built into Geeks. So you can control every aspect. You could experiment with completely new ways for computers to be operating in sync with each other and do all of this stuff that you're completely prohibited from when using a commercial operating system. Or even okay. even when you're using a non any system that's not Geeks or another similar one called Nix. You're, you do not have the power to suddenly reconfigure the whole way that your operating system is functioning and how it networks with other computers and all that. And suddenly, really just by writing a declaration, right? Like I get to, in Geeks, which also I should note, it's not spelled like G-E-E-K-S, it's spelled G-U-I-X. Geeks, you write a declaration of what you want. Like I want to use this kernel, I want to have these system, uh, these services operate with these ones like this. I want this hard drive to be used for that. You know, a- anything you can define about how an operating system functions, anything you can imagine can be declared and immediately reconfigured to give you a new system that is also possible to reproduce on the cloud or anywhere you want, really. 
So I'm hoping that having this massive flexibility and this kind of visual environment for programming, along with these tools for solving very difficult problems, can perhaps lead to people developing new speculative proposals for future communist society. I think I understand in a in a layman manner. And what it sounds to me is essentially creating tools that allow people, the user, whatever, to actually create an entirely new framework. Because the existing issue with cultural issues, with societal issues, politi- political issues and technological issues is we tend to get anchored, is the psychological term, the anchoring effect to one framework, one way of thinking. And what you're trying to do is create something that allows you to build a whole new framework, i.e. a whole new way of thinking, which will then allow you to create things that are kind of beyond the imagination of existing in the current framework or paradigm. Yeah. Is uh, that uh, it? Absolutely. I mean, you know, so the whole thing is, is we can really develop a uh, virtual infrastructure with this technology, you know, and, and, and considering everything is absolutely reproducible, like if you build something that's quite complex, like normally, like building a quite complex piece of software is one thing. Getting it to run on anyone else's computer is a whole other kind of task, right? So, yeah. so like the ability to build these kind of solutions that have integrated interfaces that you design as your programming, as a part of the programming, and the ability to deploy that. I think at least opens up new avenues for us to create our own methods of communication and technological mediation that could help the left build power in some kind of sense. I'm hoping, right? I'm hoping. Now that I kind of can understand it in a manner that IE would kind of like apply to me. (laughs) Now that we can bring it back to me. Yes, it's extremely exciting. And it's a thing that like, I think your average person doesn't even realize is is necessary because for someone like me, the technology that ex- exists is already so exciting and already seems so limitless and already seems so beyond my comprehension or my potential comprehension that the I did two things, technological mass literacy and Cybersyn, what you just described, geeks, I still don't really understand it, to be honest, <laughs> but Cybersyn, it, it is very, very exciting what that could kind of release and unleash for workers. Thank you. Yeah. I, I hope, you know, as I stated earlier, every, all of my work up until now has been a failure. And I think everyone's work insofar as humanity, humanity's existence is itself at stake. We're, we're, we're all 2020 failures, right? Uh, that that could just mean that this is my next compulsive repetition in my my chain of failures, but I think it is also coming from a more practical place that required me to to recognize the failures of my activist and theoretical practices up until now. Mm. And I think you're right to say that the blame, the responsibility lies with absolutely everybody. And to take, to have taken 2020 and to encourage others to take this time as a moment for self-reflection about what techniques and practices need to change going forward in order to diffuse the ticking time bomb that we're all living in. I think it's an excellent message to end on. I really do. And I thank you for it. All right. Well, thank you so much for having a commie like me on your show, Rachel. Pleasure. I just have to ask you, it's the final thing. Is there somebody that you like to platform? Somebody whose work inspires you or you work with or you think would be good to have on the show to continue this uh, dialogue? I would say my friend James Fontini is working on some really interesting ideas to get down. It's an investigation into what... uh, technology ultimately is and its relationship to human history and and our current end time state and i would say james would be an incredibly interesting person to to bring on the show 
Okay, fantastic. I will reach out to him. Thank you so much, Blake. It was a it was a learning curve. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Hey everyone. Well, well, did it? Did it blow your mind? It blew mine. I didn't know how little I knew about tech before speaking with Blake. Um, if you like to leave a five star rating and then head over to www.platformenterprise.com to start a conversation in the comments. Listen, everyone, the plan is to wean platform off of its social media dependency. And I'm sure you all know what I mean. So I would just love it if you subscribed. And uh, by the way, while you're there, you can check out this week's story, which is on Facebook censorship of Greek citizens. Maybe another reason to leave social media. I don't know. Thanks for supporting the podcast, everyone. I really appreciate it. See you next week.